So you defend me, my enemy. I have found you in us because you have sold yourself to me in the eyes of the Lord. I'm going to bring disaster on you. I will consume your descendants and cut off from Nahab every last man in Israel, a slave or free. I will make your house like that of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, and that of Basha, son of Ahijah, because you have provoked me to anger and have caused Israel to sin. And also concerning Jezebel, the Lord says, Dogs will devour Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Dogs will eat those belonging to Ahab who die in the city, and the birds of the air will feed on those who die in the country. There was never a man like Ahab who sold himself to him even in the eyes of the Lord, urged on by Jezebel his wife. He behaved in the vilest manner by going after idols like the Amorites the Lord drove out before Israel. When Ahab heard these words, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and fasted. He lay in sackcloth and went away immediately. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah and his wife. Have you noticed how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Mm -hmm. Because he has humbled himself, I will not bring this disaster in this day, but I will bring it on his house in the days of his son. And if we could read on into the next chapter, we would see that in actual fact, they both came to a very bad end. Okay. So what do we have here? Well, quite simply, they have sins. Sins with a capital S. And the light of the man of God turns up with God's take on the situation. Elijah, who we must understand, is a completely disinterested participant in this situation. Disinterested, notice I say. I, mean, I, don't, I didn't say not interested. He probably was interested, but he was disinterested in the sense that he has no personal involvement. He's simply God's messenger. Not giving his judgment, not personally affected by what's gone on. He has no axe to grind, he simply comes to say what God has to say about the situation. And this is the Elijah task. But because of what he says, because of what he says, Ahab concludes that Elijah doesn't like him. You see it there in verse 20, don't you? He says, oh, so you found me, my enemy. If it was today, here and now, Ahab would label uh, Elijah's coming and speaking as a hate crime. He dared to tell someone that they were wrong, morally wrong. And today, of course, that's just about the worst sin you can commit this day. If you dare to do it, if you dare to tell someone that they are wrong in what they're doing, then the assumption is that you're doing it because you don't like them. You wish them ill, maybe you have secretly got an image of them somewhere you're sticking your pins in. Um, you tell me I'm wrong, and I'll tell you you hate me. My enemy. I'm reporting this to the police. Brothers and sisters, if we're going to be faithful to God and where Elijah's mantle today, this is where we're going to find ourselves, isn't it? Elijah was simply a courier, a messenger boy. And for Ahab to react in the way he did was as foolish as for me to accuse the postman of a hate crime because he brings me disinterested. A letter that I don't like. Now you don't need to tell me. Uh, sorry, I, I, uh, I don't need to tell you that as God's people, we find ourselves in a more and more difficult situation today. There was a time <coughs> when, by and large, people around us respected the Word of God. I can even remember a time in England when if you told someone that they weren't a Christian, they would have been really quite offended. But it's very different now, isn't it? Now people actively hate 
the word of God. And they said, of course, all religion, religion is a dangerous thing, and it's a troublesome thing, and it's causing all the problems that are in the world. They're even called for it to be banned. And of course, it's very convenient for people to love all religious folk together and to label them as extremists or terrorists or radicalized or whatever. And if we dare to tell them God's take on things, on the way they live, then we, like Elijah, are in danger of being criminalized. So let's look more closely at this situation now. And I want to say three things about Elijah. And by extension, of course, about ourselves, if we believe that we have the Elijah task today. First of all, Elijah was not being judgmental here. He was not making himself the judge and jury and passing judgment on the king. He was not giving his opinion. His words are, this is what the Lord says. Says it two or three times. And he goes on to speak in the first person, the first person being God. Elijah has not come to take the high moral ground. He has come simply to deliver a message from God. And if we believe that we wear Elijah's mantle today, then please do not be judgmental in face of people's sin. We are simply God's messenger boys and girls, not their judges. Now let's, let's face it, and we have to face it, if we're not sticking our head in the sand. We live at an unprecedented time in history. Suddenly we're faced with what we might call seismic shifts in social and sexual standards of behaviour. It's as if the tectonic plates that have held the moral and spiritual universe together for thousands of years from time immemorial, it's as if these tectonic plates have shifted massively in the last few years, in some cases in the last few months, the last few weeks. And the result is a corresponding earthquake in social and sexual behaviour. The very language that we speak has changed, isn't it? Isn't it? So, Mona is now no longer my wife, she's my partner. Um, and we all, we all assume to have a partner. Uh, uh, it can be someone of the same sex, or someone of different sex, or someone of both sexes, or whatever. Um, and um, logically, of course, if you have one partner, why not have two or three? What's the odds? I remember one of me picked up a young girl in our car a few months ago and uh, gave her a lift and oh, she was telling she got a boyfriend and girlfriend. <laughs> um, we're back to what um, in a few years ago was called bigamy, legalised bigamy really. And where it's all going, I hate to think, um, with the latest trend being to increasing calls to grant human rights to certain animals. Human rights to certain animals. Well, I leave it to you to imagine what lines we're going to cross before too long. Things have changed, sizing, sizingly, and all in a very short time. And what is amazing is that if you dare to say anything to the contrary, if you dare to say that what was right 50 years ago is right today, or a thousand years ago, or even maybe 20 years ago, what's been right from time in the world, if you say that that is right today, and especially if you dare to tell people that they're wrong to disagree with you, then you are, you are criminalised. You are criminalised. Said to be judgmental, or even worse. You are a danger to society, and especially It's interesting to see that we've got an election, we've actually never got the leader of a political party in England who's an evangelical Christian. Do you realise that? The new leader of the Labour, the Liberal Party. I've only got eight MPs, but um, the, the new leader of the Liberal Party is a committed Christian. And uh, I was interested to see that apparently that during the debate on same sex marriages in Parliament, he had a stand. Um, but 
because of that, sections of the press are really taken into task. Every we have a leader of a political party in Britain who hasn't voted for same-sex marriages. It's unbelievable, isn't it? A few years ago, it would have been unthinkable. These are unprecedented and unbelievable times. And the Elijah task today is not for us to give our opinions, not to be judgmental, and certainly not to hate anyone, but simply to say what God has said. And incidentally, how can we be accused of taking the moral high ground and looking down at everybody else? But we are the very people who religiously made the point of getting up early on a Sunday morning to go to a public meeting and to acknowledge that we need forgiveness. We are sinners and need forgiveness. Not many people do that today, but we do. We come to acknowledge that we are no less than anybody else, and we're simply calling on our fellow si sinners to come to where we are and to do what we're doing, to be honest about it. In today's climate of opinion, just about the most heinous crime you can commit is to tell someone that the standards by which we live are not merely personal but universal. They apply to him as well as to me. Often oh, no, people will say, You believe what you want to believe? That's all right, I won't stop you. But the social contract is that you won't stop me believing what I want to believe. You cannot say that your standards, your morals, are universal and absolute. And that was in Elijah's problem, wasn't it? And it's ours. According to Ahab's standards, he could do what he wanted. His power was absolute. Magna Carta would not be signed for another 2,000 years. <coughs> so when Elijah comes along and says, Sorry, sir, there are higher standards than yours, and they're universal. Ahab didn't like what Elijah said, so he thought that Elijah didn't like him. So you bury my enemy. You don't like me, so I don't like you. A modern man accusing Elijah of hate crimes. Brothers and sisters, if we're going to be honest, and the best thing to do is to be honest, is it? That's what we're here for. I'm afraid that the days when as Christians we could expect some respect for living by certain standards of decency, they're over. We're going to have to make a tough stuff from now on. Uh, like many of our spiritual ancestors had to be. I recently read that in the first 300 years of the Christian Church, in the days of the Roman Empire, before Constantine made Christianity the official religion of the Empire, in those three, first 300 years, something like 6 million Christians were martyred. That's as many <coughs> Jews as were martyred in, in the Holocaust. Uh, and these dear Christian people were not terrorists. By and large, they were pacifists. Lots and lots of them were simple servant girls, martyred, simply because they said, the law of God is above the law of man. Their prime analysis is well summed up in the quotation from the Acts of the Apostles, where it says about the Christians, they said that there was another king, one called Jesus. Caesar's legitimacy was that might is right, but Jesus' legitimacy was higher. And here we're talking about maker's rights, aren't we? He made us, he made us, so he has every right to say what goes. Full stop. Elijah had not come to judge, and nor he simply had a message from God. And uh, he had to tell Ahab that God is the one to not only Elijah, but also Ahab himself would be harsh. And Elijah was simply 
the message. No judgment. No one will be And the second thing we can say about Elijah here is this he was not prejudiced. And nor are we to be prejudiced. And here's one of many words which in that tectonic shift and that earthquake that we spoke about a few moments ago. One word that has come to me in something quite different from what it has traditionally meant. So today if we say anything against what is supposed to be called politically correct, whatever that means, if we say that anyone is in any way slightly different from anybody else or in some way less capable than anybody else, then we say to be prejudiced. Prejudiced. It's come to me having an unreasonable bias against something or someone. But what does prejudice actually mean? It means that we pass judgment on someone or something before we've heard what the law says, the final authority has to say. You see the word pre judice pre judice means making a judgment before listening to the final word, the law. <coughs> And for us as Christians, what is the law as far as we're concerned? Well, it is what God has said, isn't it? It's simple. If we make a judgment before we listen to what God says about something, then we are truly, literally prejudiced. Um, as Christians, our unashamed position must be the same as the apostles. We must obey God rather than men. Um, if we want to make the right judgment upon anything, an unprejudiced judgment, then first we have to listen to what God has to say and then go with that. Like Elijah, he had heard from God. He got God's word on the situation, so he was unprejudiced. He wasn't acting before hearing what God had to say. In fact, um, Elijah, the week of where he's planted, are just the opposite of pre judice prejudice. We are post judice We hear what the Judas say, the Lord of God is, and then that is where we stand. But the sticking point between Ahab and Elijah was precisely the sticking point between us and modern man. The question is, which law are we going to obey? The law of man or the law of God, which is the higher law. And of course as Christian, as a Christian, I have to go with Jesus. Jesus who said, don't be afraid of men. Literally he said, don't be homophobic. Now that's another word which would be completely against To be homophobic means fear man. And Jesus says, don't be homophobic, don't fear man. Jesus said, don't be homophobic, don't fear man. The very worst he can do to you is kill you. No, Jesus said, be theophobic, fear God, who has the power not only to kill your body, but also to cast body and soul into hell. Yes, he said, I tell you, fear him. And it's when we tell modern man that the word of God is above and applies to us all, that's why we're accused of being hateful as men, prejudiced, and so on. Which, of course, is precisely by definition what we are not. Brothers and sisters, we live in an unbelievable time. Among the seismic shifts that are taking place today, um, making it much more difficult for us to carry the Elijah times, is something our own Prime Minister recently said. It passed by almost unnoticed, but I picked it up afterwards in one of the serious newspapers. He overthrew in one sentence the moral and spiritual tectonic plates that have remained unmoved thousands of years, the Prime Minister said that religious dogma is not above human law. 
In other words, the law of God is not above the law of man, said our Prime Minister. How do we arrive at human law today? Well, we arrive at it simply by a majority decision, don't we? And often it's not a majority decision of the mass of the it's a majority decision of a few people. We arrive at human law, we arrive at what is right and wrong by simply asking the question, what do most people want to do? What most people want to do is therefore right. That's unbelievable, isn't it? So the law of God is now not above the law of man. Not above what the majority of people want to do. It's that that becomes absolute now. What the majority of people want to do. In a sense, man is putting himself in the place of God, isn't he? And if you want to do some homework, read 2 Thessalonians 2 and see what that says there, and then conclude what you will. And I think you'll conclude with me that Jesus is coming again soon. 2 Thessalonians 2. In Ahab's time, it was not what the majority wanted to do that was right, but what the king wanted to do. That was absolute. And either way, when Elijah or his modern counterpart turns up, having heard from God, not prejudice, but having heard the final word, he now has a dangerous and difficult task. He's certainly not. Third thing he said about Elijah here yeah, is that he only wanted the best for the king. Elijah do not hate anyone. Did you notice at the end of the story here yeah, that in response to Elijah's word, Ahab actually had a change of heart? Verse 27. When Ahab heard these words, he tore his clothes, put on a sackcloth, and fasted. They in sackcloth and went to bed deeply. And God says to Elijah, No, oh, Elijah, do you see that? Ahab has humbled himself. And because he's humbled himself, I'm not going to punish him as severely as I was going to. In other words, because Elijah came to Ahab, and Ahab made a response, his punishment was reduced. Both God and Elijah were glad that they had partial repentance. They only wanted the best for him. And brothers and sisters, it's because we want the best for people that we sometimes have to tell them they're wrong. That is a silly modern idea that you mustn't tell anybody that they're going on wrong. It's just what I said it is, it's a silly modern idea. If I see a blind man walking towards the edge of a precipice, and I say to myself, well, a few years ago I would have told him he was heading for disaster, but today I can't say anything because it's not politically correct to tell someone they're going wrong. I'd love to tell him he's walking towards the edge of the precipice, but he might take offence. When Ahab said to Elijah, uh -huh, so you fed me then, my enemy, he would have been that far the other truth to say, so you found me, my friend. But because Elijah's visits always seemed to be to tell the king that he was doing wrong, Ahab thought that Elijah didn't like him. And that's what we're up against today, isn't it? As we often have to say to our teenage children, I'm telling you don't like to hear precisely because I love you and I want the best for you. Sin never makes anyone happy for long. It never gives you dignity, respect or health and strength. It promises much, it delivers nothing and then when you're dead it kicks you. It kicks you when you're dead. And we need to be warned up. Because God is our judge, and Jesus said He is recording everything. 
But Ahab was a very long man. You tell me I'm doing wrong, and I will tell you your agree. In fact, he says exactly the same thing in the very next chapter when another prophet comes to him. Chapter 22, verse 8. Um, and uh, the king of Israel answered and said, There's still one man who we can inquire from the Lord, but I hate him because he never prophesies anything good about him but all things that that's talking about another prophet um, who came King Ahab's way. I hate him because he never prophesies anything good about him. Who's responsible for hate crimes here? Elijah, the other prophet, or Ahab? I hate him. He says. And once again in this second story, chapter 22, we know he had a God's disinterested messenger coming to tell the king God to take on the situation. Hoping, no doubt, that he would do some good. But Ahab's take was, I hate him because he obviously hates me. That's elementary psychology in terms of if you hate someone for whom you have a tough message, then they will never listen to what you say. People don't, if people know, don't know. If they know do they, they will never listen to what you say. So Jesus was always telling us to love the people who don't like us. Because it's only when they know that we love them that they will listen to our word. And that's the challenge at this most significant crossroads in our history is now. To love people. To love them like God loves them. To love them to bits because it's only then that we are likely to be. And in a world that increasingly loves its sin, institutionalizes its sin, a world that tries to remove all traditional concepts of right and wrong, a world that calls black white and white black, or better still, a world that calls everything today a shade of grey. We have to be. God's disinterested, I don't say not interested, but disinterested, messenger of all these things. Not self-starved judges, not prejudiced bigots, not confusing people with their sin, but like God, loving a sinner as much as we hate the sin. And when people say to us, they are not enemy, my enemy. We need to show them in practical ways that we are, in fact, their friends. We're on their side. And like Elijah, our heart is breaking because we know that we are all in the hands of God. And we ask the best of them. Amen? Amen. Okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. I pray that it's come across clearly. Lord, it's tough, um, but it's been like this for so many Christians in so many places and so many times. And uh, I pray that we'll be up to the challenge and somehow be able to so love people when we speak the truth that we know that we're only doing it for our own good. So, Father God, we pray for your help in these difficult times. You have seen fit to, to place us in this moment in history when these tectonic plates are shifting. And right is wrong now, wrong is right. And we're here uh, standing isolated on the side of your word. We pray to your God for help us. Give us wisdom. Give us courage, we pray. Give your church all that she needs in these difficult days to hold forth our own life. We pray to you.
I noticed this morning that the very last song in the Red Bull here, one of those songs, recent songs by Stuart Jensen, and I thought, oh, I'd love to sing that tonight as we finish our time together. The power of the cross, okay? This is the power of the cross. Christ became a sin for us. He took the blame for the wrong. We stand for you at the cross. Okay, let's stand to sing. Last, very last one, A12, very last song in your, in your red book. If you haven't got A12 in it, um...